Thank you so much, Arno, for this nice introduction. So, um, yes, I'm an electrical engineer, and I think I never really worked as an electrical engineer since I finished uh, my PhD. And of course, like the work I'm doing today is very broad, and um, I'm really trying to to also understand what are the different disciplines doing in, in the energy field. And that's also why I really enjoy this work at the Energy Science Center. I will talk a little bit more what we actually do and what we are. And, uh, but also in my work, previous work at the um, uh, Swiss Federal Office of Energy, as it's officially called, the Ministry of Energy, of course also there already it was very broad and it was clear that energy is not something for just engineers or just economists or just uh, um, also social scientists or for the regulatory work. It's really a quite complex system. And uh, this is what fascinates me about this topic. And that's also why I call this, uh, this talk here the, the energy system of the future, a system of systems. Of course, it's a buzzword, or let's uh, talk about it. But I think that's what I would like to, to focus on today, that we have these different system aspects in, in the energy system. And each of you is, is expert in one or two, uh, and maybe linking a couple of them. But I think the, the big picture we only get if we see the, the, everything together. And that's what I'm trying to, to talk about today, really also to, to stimulate discussion. And I, of course, uh, open you to ask questions during my talk afterwards and uh, hopefully also uh, during the coming weeks and months. I'm here until um, uh, early July. Well, in Singapore, a little bit longer, but I'm taking some vacations at the end. But uh, so I really do hope that we get some interactions also until the end. So let me start. Uh, what is the Energy Science Center? Um, if you look at energy research at ETH Zurich, you see that about 100 professors are active in the energy field. Some of them very little. They have one or two projects. Some of them like almost 100%. But it's really a, a large, uh, so it's basically a fifth of all professors at ETH Zurich have something to do with energy research. So that's, I think energy research is really quite important. And um, out of these 100, there's actually now 70 professors are, are members. I think that I have to update the numbers. Uh, actually, 70 are members of the Energy Science Center. The Energy Science Center is a so-called competence center. So we're not a professorship. We have very little staff. It's basically me and, and uh, two, three other people. Uh, so what we try to do is like bring people together from all these 11 departments that are involved and bring them together in, in research, uh, try to come up with research ideas that cannot be tackled by one single uh, department, by one single professor. Uh, also work in, in, the, in the education. The Master of Energy Science and Technology was mentioned, but we're also involved in the Master of Integrated Building Systems. That's another uh, master uh, that many of you might know uh, that started quite recently. And uh, of course, then also in outreach. So we try also to bring this topic of energy research to the bigger public. We have large events at ETH. We work a lot with, with uh, the administration as well. We have many workshops with, with them, and then also with industry. So we really also try to be a single point of contact within ETH Zurich, but also to the outside, to other universities. If you look then at energy research at ETH, you really see that we have all these individual professors that I was talking about, and they work in, in different topics. So they work in, well, a couple of uh, names are uh, printed here, but they're, they're working in different topics. And uh, as long as they are doing their own stuff, I would say, the Energy Science Center is not really involved. So each professor has its own projects, etc. We try to get involved. Once um, we have these so-called areas of action or cross-cutting themes, I think that's the important part there. Whenever we think there are topics that cannot be tackled, as I said before, by one discipline, where we need more disciplines to work together, for example, economists and engineers, or architects and engineers, then we try to, to help, we try to, to be there and try to bring these people together. Of course, that happens uh, also without the Energy Science Center, but the Energy Science Center is a, is a place to really faci facilitate this. In the last four years, we had uh, four areas where we kind of focused on. It was energy and information. I'm going to talk a little bit about this today. Uh, integration of renewables, of course, that's a very uh, important uh, topic. The integrated modeling part, this is also something I'm talking about today. And then something we haven't really explored yet, but we think there's still a lot to, to explore. It's the energy water land nexus. 
and maybe we even put in uh, climate as well, uh, but of course you, you might know how, how this works. So that's basically the part where we work as the Energy Science Center, and then we have some flagship programs where also out of these research projects we build platforms that we hope will continue to be used in, in, in the foreseeable future. That's, these are then the flagship pro programs. So that's the Energy Science Center. It's really something that we try to to, to bring in um, all the researchers of energy, uh, or maybe not all, but th those interested together, and um, really create added value to the research community in the field of energy. Now, as I told you, as I've seen from the title, I would like to talk about the system, the energy system, and what, what does it encompass. And we are here at the, um, the Future Cities Laboratory, and um, of course, what you are thinking, or most of you are thinking, is uh, somehow in the terms of buildings, districts, cities, and how they interact. So this is basically what, what, what you do here. And um, as an electrical engineer, when I started uh, with my studies, of course, like all this part was basically just one arrow, basically meaning a load. So this is the other, uh, the other end, right? And now I would like to talk a little bit about how these things are coming together. Um, so this has nothing to do with energy yet. It's just like the, the, the urban landscape. Um, so what then normally comes into play is a distribution system. That can be gas, electricity, or heat, or cooling. So basically, how do you distribute um, energy within a city, but also within buildings? You could also draw an arrow here, but then it would be too many arrows. And of course, like already, this system is very complex. And uh, uh, there's a lot of research going on here. Basically, with each of these arrows, you can have many, many research projects, and also many pre research projects going on. And Linked to the distribution system, you normally have the decentralized production, which of course like always uh, also has a, normally a direct link to, to the buildings. Maybe I should draw this line as well. But uh, so this is then something that is being tackled a lot today and being discussed a lot today, all the distributed uh, energy production within a city, within buildings, within, within uh, um, uh, districts. But of course you know that that's not all yet. There is more. And one thing that is quite often neglected if you look at the system is the transmission system because uh, um, cities like Singapore, they are not, well, they are an island, but not in terms of energy. Singapore is importing gas. So there is a transmission system that tr transmits energy over long, long distances. In Switzerland, of course, you have a distribution system, but then you have a large transmission system within Switzerland, but also linked, linked to, to the rest of Europe. And this cannot be seen independent, and, and we'll, we'll uh, talk about it a little bit more, why, why this is so important to also see this part. And then linked to the transmission system, you of course have the large uh, production units, uh, like nuclear power, but also large wind farms. They are not decentralized production, they are really centralized big, big units. So um, this is kind of like a, um, a picture of how we, we could see the energy system. Of course, there are many ways of looking at it. But now, or maybe in the future, it becomes more interesting. And I'm just showing two, two buzzwords here, but they, I could add many more uh, in blue now. We have, for example, the e-mobility that is su suddenly coming in, or at least, or let's put it, uh, we could also call it smart mobility, or like the future of mobility. Um, more and more, this really needs to also to be linked, because, uh, I mean, if you change from, from fossil uh, based cars to e-mobility, it suddenly has a link to, to the buildings, to the districts, because you need charging stations, but it also influences your system. So you're suddenly uh, moving into a world where there need to be much more connection than just the roads and, and parking lots that you had, had earlier days. But there is even more. There's the whole, um, again, a buzzword, but the whole uh, development of Internet of Things. Uh, we all are using Grab nowadays, or Uber, or whatever. And uh, suddenly you see that there, there's this link between mobility and, and uh, the information technology that is coming in. But this could also be demand side management. It could also be that there are many things behind it. I just put uh, Internet of Things as, as one of the words that you can kind of like, take everything together. And you have a strong link to, to decentralized production as well. 
you can, when you have all this data, of course, move in a, to a direction where you can start uh, optimizing the systems, the, the energy systems, also based on, on information that is available. And we had the discussion uh, other days um, that, of course, like for example, you could use um, uh, data from mobile um, uh, communication to be able to better understand how e-mobility will, will uh, be explored in the future. How this again then in influences decentralized production. So this is a whole world that is just starting to become uh, um, interesting or become explored. And I know uh, quite a few of you are working on there. But I, I do believe strongly that th there is a lot of potential here uh, that has not been explored. Now, so this kind of is a, is a picture of how this whole energy system that we are all working in could, could look like. But let's look at how actually uh, researchers or, or professional people are, are looking at the system. And this is kind of the view the old utilities had on the energy system. So if you talk to, to a utility here in Singapore or in Switzerland, quite often they're more or less working in this field here. They know they're either distribution companies or, or, or large uh, production units. They knew this system with a transmission system, centralized production and distribution system. That's how it was done. It was a top-down approach. You had large units, then transmission system, then distribution system. And somewhere you had the kind of, in, in quotes, dumb load. So you have loads, meaning buildings or cars or whatever, uh, that just use the electricity or the gas or whatever the energy is. So that was it's kind of the old time. However, I put it in quotes, if you talk to, to utilities today, you still feel this thing, at least in parts of these companies. Some companies in Germany, for example, they started to kind of have bad banks and good, good banks in terms of like the old world and the new world. And there are still engineers that are working here. And this is not a trivial system. It's actually very complex. And it's becoming more complex uh, as we have more uh, variability in the system due to renewables. So it's not easy, for example, to really make this link between transmission system and distribution system. So it's not that this is all done, but it is kind of a limited uh, view of the world. Um, now, when you go to engineers, well, I think they started many power engineers, for example, as also like when I did my PhD, we only looked at centralized production and transmission system and made like optimizations there and then interesting uh, uh, findings. Nowadays, I think it's clear that we have to include decent production distribution system. So this is kind of like the, the, the system that engineers and also often economists, if they really want to go into energy, look at the world. But they completely forget this part here. Also the, the, the whole smart part, right? So they just look at this and again have the, the, the loads, the cities, the, the, the buildings, but also mobility kind of as an as a external part to their simulation or their view. And this is also how energy systems nowadays are still planned. Quite often they just take the, the, this part as kind of given, getting numbers from somewhere, and then the whole optimization and de uh, design and then optimization and, and, uh, and um, also how, how it's uh, run, that's basically done in, in this world. Now, uh, don't uh, kill me now for the next uh, few slides because it might be a little bit uh, provocative as well. Um, well, first, okay, sorry. First, I would like to show you one example of, of, of this world where we are having a research project right now and also hope that we get some more interactions with, with you. Um, so the first uh, research project we are looking at, and, and you see that already, if I go back, already this system is very complex. So uh, it's called Nexus Integrated Energy System Modeling. It's a vision of a modeling platform because we found that many professors at ETH Zurich they, they work in a specific field of energy, for example, in hydropower. But they need to, to have a model for, for, for the rest. They need to have a lot model for the transmission system, maybe even to, down to the distribution system to understand their or to link that to their, their special um, uh, modeling or, or research they're doing. And so we thought it, it would be good if we have a, a platform that everybody could use and then kind of add the modules that the individual researcher is really good at. 
but then for the rest use a standard uh, platform. And that's why, why we started uh, with this um, integrated system modeling platform. We call it Nexus. It's really an interdisciplinary work. We have different types of engineers included, um, uh, grid experts, uh, production experts, optimization people. We have economists in there to really understand the whole question of who is investing when and what, and also to understand the macroeconomy. So really, we have the bottom-up engineering-based uh, uh, approach there, where you look at grids and, and uh, uh, production units, and we have the top-down macroeconomic and policy aspect, and this is being linked. And in terms of modeling, uh, this is also the step forward there that we really try to combine bottom-up and top-down approaches in one uh, um, heuristic approach. Um, what, it's really also the idea that we develop a common understanding of this system because it's not trivial. And when we started this project, we had about a, a one-year uh, pre-phase. And, and the, the most challenging part there was really to get the engineers and the economists talk to each other and to understand each other. What, what are the issues? What does, does for example, a dynamic mean in this regard? Because economists, they understand co something completely different from the engineers. And of course, the time constants are completely different. You have like, in, in, in the bottom up part, you go down to minutes if you want to look at uh, security of supply. And in, in the uh, um, macroeconomic approach, of course, you have uh, years to decades to understand the, the investment behaviors. And how do you bring these together? How do you create the interfaces? So that's what we are working on. And we have a, a few principles that are very important to us. We want the whole thing to be transparent. So it should not be a black box. It should be really something that everybody could, that uses it could, can look into, can look at the code. We want to have not everything in one monolithic uh, model, but we have defined uh, modules. So modularity is, is very important. And combined to that are defined interfaces. So we are not trying to invent, reinvent everything, but we're really working on these data interfaces. And this is something that is um, also very special in this project in terms of compared to other classical research projects. We spend a lot of time on, on these interfaces, discussing them, defining them, and also documenting them. Um, so that's the work plan here. We started in 2016 for the first phase. We do an imp applied implementation. What we are looking at is really the effect of um, variability in the system. So we have more variability due to renewables. And how do you can, co can you cope with it? What kind of flexibility do you need to, to uh, match this variability? And flexibility in our uh, project here can mean everything from large hydro stations power um, gas-fired stations down to batteries in each household. So we really have the whole um, uh, range of, of variability providers, as we call them, in, in the system. And this is something new. And this exactly shows why you need this complex system, because you need centralized and decentralized systems being active in the same uh, uh, field. Um, so there, I, I really hope uh, with some of you I can go into more details and discussion and to see also how we could link other things that are being developed here at, at uh, uh, the SEC, how we could maybe link that maybe now, maybe in the future to this uh, platform. OK. Um, now, to the provocative part. <laughs> I'm going back to, to my picture. and. Um, I've been working in, in, in my, my career at ETH in the, in the Energy Science Center. I've been working with, with many disciplines and also with, with architects. And uh, of course, you, again, it's provocative. There are some architects who see kind of like, who don't see the energy system. Let's put it like this. Who just look at city buildings, district uh, planning, uh, urban planning. Of course, that's also very complex. Uh, but. Uh, I hope we can also move away from this. Uh, that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm working for the energy science sy system. But there, there are other um, uh, architects um, who may be seeing the, the energy system more like this, that they look at one building or maybe a couple of buildings, they look at the distribution system, and then decentralized production, but kind of forget that there are other things that also need to be part of it. Again, I know that you, you not the, um, well, that everybody knows that the larger picture as well, and you have to focus on something. But uh, j uh, just uh, to, to um, when you e explore people, that that's something that happens quite often, and the understanding quite often is not there. What, for example, the link between a distribution system and transmission system is. Just to give you a, a quick example, uh, 
in this system, quite often you need, or people are working with electricity prices. And they suddenly go to, to variable pr uh, prices because that makes it more interesting. You can optimize more and then you can, can create interesting results. However, quite often in reality, the, the price that you see as a household is flat over the year and maybe even of a over a couple of years. So you don't even have these signals that you need to make, for example, a local, uh, um, uh, local battery storage economically feasible. So this is, these are links that need to be understood to, to make it possible to, to work with, with these systems. And I think that's really also where it becomes very interesting. Uh, we also work in this field, so I'll give you another example, and um, we call it Integration of Sustainable Multi-Energy Hub Systems at Neighborhood Scale, EMIS. It's again a very interdisciplinary project. We have all different kinds of engineers there. We have uh, economists, we have even social scientists about the acceptance. And here we're not only looking at electricity, we're really looking at electricity, gas, and heat. It's based on, on uh, European funding, so it's more in, the, in, in this hemisphere, so it's not about uh, cooling. We don't have cooling in here. However, the principle could be explored as well. So the idea is really that we have different neighborhoods that all function like an energy hub. So an energy hub is basically a conversion station from different energy carriers to another. So for example, from, from uh, electricity to, to heat or from, from uh, um, heat and uh, to, to electricity or also having storage elements in there. And then they are linked through um, electric and gas grids and maybe a local heat grid as well, a district uh, heating. And um, we are looking at these systems uh, using a couple of uh, cases. So we're looking at uh, small cities in Switzerland and, and parts of, of larger cities, like a part of, of Zurich, but never a whole city. So it's really this uh, smaller view there. But it's already very interesting because we're really going down into the details of technologies, like how a heat pump works, how a CHP, a combined heat and power uh, unit works, how batteries work, and how they all can work together. And the interesting part is now that we basically have two optimization parts. One is in the design. So we look at a neighborhood. We kind of take the, the buildings, again, that's this not linked to, to, to neighborhood planning or city planning. We take a neighborhood as it is, and then we try to come up with an optimized setup of technologies, like how, man, how much storage does it need, what kind of PV, how much PV, what kind of other uh, technologies do we need in there. So we have a, a, a system optimization, system design optimization that uses a, a hub simulator here. And this data then, this design data is then given to another control uh, optimization system using a similar hub simulator, but now looking at the operation. So real-time operation. So there we have uh, control professors that are involved. Um, and uh, look, then look how this hopefully optimal design actually works in, in reality. Does it really work? Does it have problems? Uh, do we have dynamic problems? And there is a, a feedback between those two. It's, it's a soft link, so it's not a hard link. So feedback to design people saying like, we need more storage, we need uh, other setup to make it work. So the output of all this then, including some economic analysis also on how much actually the costs are, we get an optimized hub system. That's uh, one thing we do there. Uh, we also develop this, this um, modeling tech methodology. That's not something that has been done that often. So that will be another output. And then we also have a social assessment. We look at, uh, we ask really people, would they like to have something in their neighborhood with all these different technologies or what will be the, the problems there? Okay. So uh, these were just two examples of, of uh, larger energy science center projects that are involved here. And um, I don't want to talk too long, so I'm getting back to my picture here. And one thing I, I said before, we are moving more and more into the, the smart uh, world, or smart is being used for everything, smart buildings, smart cities, smart uh, distribution systems, uh, smart mobility, and then of course, uh, internet of things. So this is kind of like the smart world. And uh, everybody talks about it, everybody wants to enter it. You know that also big players like Apple and, and Google are trying to enter it, Microsoft is, of course as well. But what is interesting if you look at this, that if you look at the solutions that start to exist now, they normally only are at one or two of these arrows, so one or two links. So for example, you have maybe a link between mobility and then local storage. Uh, for example, Tesla is trying to do that. Uh, you have uh, links between uh, decentralized production and distribution systems. 
so a distribution system. So this is something that the utilities will start to move into to actually make their distribution system, which are today normally run as a black box, being more intelligent, using data they didn't have before, trying to, to understand this. Um, there, there, of course, are also like links that start to, to pop up, uh, like how you plan your, your, your city, that you don't take energy just as a, uh, as a thing that comes later in, in the planning of, of new areas, but this is very difficult. I have been working with the city of Zurich a little bit, and even, even the city of Zurich, who really kind of thinks of themselves as being very advanced, they failed for, in the development of, of uh, new areas to actually take the energy aspect into their planning from a very early stage on. But what you see is like, there's none, no really system or, or, or approach that kind of encompasses everything here. And I think that's where we would need to, to move to, that we take all these aspects into, to, into account to be able to really move into a smart energy system, if you like this term or not. And of course, like, Normally, these, the other two things, transmission system and centralized production, they are not being taken into account at all. And I think this is another thing that needs to be added because only then we understand also the development of electricity prices. So I don't know if you follow the, the, the news in, in, in Switzerland, but in Switzerland we have this issue of low electricity prices at the moment. And they are not due to any local regulations or Swiss system. They are really due to overproduction in Europe. There is too much uh, capacity in Europe right now because economic growth was not as, as expected. And you know these investment cycles, they are more like 10 to 30 years uh, for big units. So there's just too much electricity in Europe, so prices are down. There are a couple of other factors like CO2, like uh, the, the uh, renewables in, in Germany, so like other factors. But all these together really created low energy prices, electricity prices. And they directly influence uh, the production park in Switzerland. And if you only look at this part here, you don't get this, this information and you get, don't get this, this uh, picture, and, and which is fundamental to what, what might happen in Switzerland, might even change the, the outcome of the referendum that is coming up on, on May 24th. So to kind of come to the end of my talk and what I would like to, to, to really stress here is um, this how, right? Um, how do we bring all this together? And I think what doesn't really work is if we if we take everything like this into one monolithic system, put all the, the data in there, put all the models in there, and try to run the, the world model, right? That uh, I think everybody knows here that doesn't work. It probably also doesn't work if you would take one, like in reality, if you want to run such a system, you're having one agency that runs the whole thing here with the um, incredible amount of data and try to, to fix everything. So I think we need to, to have an approach, both in modeling and also in, a, in, in, in then operation, that uses local information, that uses local um, approaches, but always linked to the other parts. And this linkage, again, like coming back to what I, I was saying in the Nexus project, this linkage is not trivial. It's very complex. You need to understand what data is needed, at what time, what what interval, uh, what, what uh, um, accuracy do you need it, etc. And uh, I think then if we move there and really always try to look across the fence to the other system, I think that's when, when it becomes very interesting. And one way of, of starting to do that could be that we take, for example, this part, the, the, the classical electrical system in, in one module that is kind of feasible to, to, to model that together nowadays. <clears throat> but then also have this building distribution system centralized production in, in one uh, bubble that could be taken together. And you see already here, you have large overlaps. So this is uh, one, uh, another of these uh, challenges. How do you deal with these overlaps? And then, of course, like the whole question of, of uh, city planning, urban planning, uh, together then with, with the other parts, taking, again, like looking at these interfaces and, and really uh, taking uh, um, the, the things uh, together. So I think like this, we could really start to, to explore the uh, more holistic view of, of the energy system. And of course, as you see here, the, the kind of modern things um, that was done on purpose are only partly included yet. I think there's still much to explore on how the whole data uh, aspect could, could play a role and how we could um, take that more into account, both in, in modeling and, and, and design, as well as then in, in the operation of, of energy systems. So that was uh, my brief overview. Again, 
for me also as, as a food for thought or food for discussion. Uh, I'm very happy that I can be here. Thanks again for all, all the people that made uh, my visit here uh, possible. And um, with that, I would like to finish and uh, I'm open for questions.